Okay, so thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we have a very special keynote address from Professor Elaine Scary. Professor Scary is an American essayist and dedicated professor of English and American literature and language. Since 1987, she has conducted research on issues involving consent to war, uh, the themes of which are reflected in her 2014 book, Thermonuclear Monarchy, and which she has lectured on at all types of events, such as this one, as well as more formal law school and humanities forums over the last couple of years. She is presently the Walter M. Cabot Professor of Aesthetics and the General Theory of Value at Harvard University. And she's the author of um, the aforementioned 2014, Choosing Between Democracy and Doom, Thermonuclear Monarchy. And this book makes an extremely compelling case for the elimination of nuclear weapons, which I imagine many of us today do not necessarily need convincing on, but perhaps we can um, use her arguments and her information to further our own advocacy and conversations out in the community. So it is really our great honor as Peace Action Maine to be hosting Professor Elaine Scary tonight for our keynote talk at our annual fall gathering. Um, this year is critically relevant to have Professor Scary with us, as you all know, because it is 75 years after the heartbreaking destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Sorry, my dog is jumping around. Um, and at a time that our leadership is of this country is hinting at new weapons uh, systems like the world has never seen, especially when we know he has a terrifying degree of power to make unilateral decisions about the use of those weapons. Um, so I know I, for one, am very grateful to Professor Scary for joining us tonight. And um, we actually, uh, I believe, are able, please correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, to uh, send you copies of her book if you are interested in those, uh, purchasing one of those, if you don't already have one. Um, and so you can ask about that uh, in the chat box or at our Peace Action email address, which you likely already have access to because you made it here. Um, but if not, just in case, we'll put it in the chat box. So all that being said, thank you so much for being with us tonight, especially in this unusual format, Professor Scary. And I will turn it over to you. And again, let me know if you have any issues in running your slideshow. I will, and I'm, I'm grateful to uh, Devin and Brenton for handling all the technicalities of the Zoom program. And um, if anybody is raising their hand, I might not be able to see it. So please just interrupt me if somebody's trying to ask a question. And I'm delighted to be speaking to Maine Peace Action and grateful to uh, the whole group and to people on the board like Stephen Oliver and Martha Spies. And as you may know, uh, at Mass Peace Action, we're incredibly indebted to Martha Spies who filmed our whole conference several years ago. And it happened to be that our own science center at Harvard, which rarely makes a mistake, uh, as far as we know, never makes a mistake on filming, somehow failed to do it and we, only have films um, for many other people to see who weren't at the conference because of um, Martha's having filmed every single lecture. So I'm going to um, open my PowerPoint now, and uh, that means that all of us will probably get a bit smaller. Um, but uh, before some of you joined, um, Devin and Breton explained that if you want to make the people larger, you can just tug on that box um, or you can go up to the screen sharing uh, green tab and you might be able to reduce the size of the PowerPoint. But on my computer, I'm able to just um, now see you quite well because I just enlarged all the, the grid that has your pictures. So as my title suggests, this has got two subjects. One, thermonuclear monarchy, that is the really obscene architecture that we have in nuclear weaponry on the one hand. And on the other hand, the silence of most of the population, which I'm sure is painful to all of you, just as it's painful to me. 
In working for nuclear abolition, I've often been struck for the, by the fact that one particular group of people that seems very alert to the problem of nuclear weapons, to the huge peril of nuclear weapons, happens to be astronomers and astrophysicists. This strikes me all the time for a number of reasons, one of which is many of my academic colleagues seem completely um, indifferent to the problem, but also the fact that astronomers uh, have their eyes on the whole universe might have led me to believe that they could leave what's happening on our small planet behind. They are often looking at um, other very remarkable planets, uh, solar systems, not just solar systems, but galaxies like this sombrero galaxy that's outside the Milky Way. And this next image shows a tiny little fraction of our night sky in which the Hubble was able to take a picture that shows literally thousands of galaxies that are as big or bigger than the Milky Way. And in trying to understand why astronomers are so alert to this, two of them, Martin Rees, who's the Royal Astronomer of Britain, and then um, a man named um, Mario Livio, who is an astronomer at the Hubble Telescope, gave me this explanation that the reason they're so aware of it is because they are looking outside our planetary system and they see that nowhere else Nowhere else do they see what we have here, um, any kind of life, and especially not life that has these so many varied, amazing, miraculous forms, and then in addition, the, our own human civilization. They also explain that in astronomy, this is known as something uh, that is called the Fermi, Fermi's paradox. And Fermi's paradox says, how is it possible that with literally trillions of planets out there that have the conditions for life? Because there have to be, I mean, if you just look at the number of galaxies and each of those galaxies has um, hundreds of billions of stars and you know, many, many of them are gonna then have planets. How is it possible that we haven't yet found any sign of life? And one, two explanations are most often given. This was explained to me by Mario Livio and um, Martin Rees. Some kind of bottleneck prevents life from emerging on these other planets. And the most likely kind of bottleneck either occurs very early in life formation or very late in life formation. So the early phase says that um, we know that on Earth, unicellular life came almost immediately, as soon as Earth cooled down a little bit, uh, single cell life came into being. But multi-celled life took millions of years, the jump from single cell to multi-cell. So one hypothesis is that this is an early bottleneck that other um, planets have not uh, surmounted yet. Now, the other bottleneck occurs late in uh, the history of life on any planet, and that is that, um, that in the late stage of life, the life form is so sophisticated that it is able to uh, convey and communicate across interstellar distance, and yet a, a civilization that can communicate across interstellar distance is also going to be sophisticated enough to make weapons with which it can blow up its planet, and it will, and it has. That's the hypothesis, and it's held by many astronomers, that there is, we aren't finding life on other planets because every time they get to the stage that we're at right now, they can't they can't overcome it. They can't uh, abstain from using these things with which they destroy their planet. And I think this is a very important revelation because yes, we think solving this problem is hard, 
when we just look at it from the point of view of Earth. But when you look at it from the point of view of the universe, we see that it's even harder than we thought. What we on Earth are trying to do right now in getting past these weapons that have the power to destroy our whole planet is something that probably other planets have tried and failed at. And so it should be that all our resources, all our best minds are working on how to overcome that. And, uh, and that if we do overcome it, we may be the only planet or maybe one of the few planets that has overcome it. Um, I don't know what the architecture of those weapon systems might look like on other planets, but I know what ours looks like, and you probably do too. This is one summary image of what that weapon system looks like uh, that's made by the, um, the Nagasaki Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Evolution. And there are just a couple of important things. Uh, there are many important things to know about this image, but I'm just going to stress a couple of them. First of all, the legend tells you that each little icon represents not one warhead, but five warheads. So to get the picture of how many warheads there are, you need to multiply the image that you see there by five. Uh, times, which clearly cannot be held within the compass of a uh, rectangle like the one we can put up on the screen. The second thing to know is something that I am guessing all of you know, which is that 93% of the world's arsenal is owned by the United States and Russia. The United States owns all the warheads that we see on the screen from about three o'clock sweeping down, going clockwise to about you know, 7.30 or 8, and then all the weapons that start right next to it um, and sweep around from, say, 8 o'clock up to 1 o'clock are owned by Russia, and then that tiny wedge that's around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock are owned by the other seven nuclear states. Um, and the uh, these weapons are... Uh, owned not by countries we hear about all, always in the news. We always hear about Iran. Iran isn't on this map. Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons. We hear about Iraq. Iraq isn't on this map. Iraq doesn't have nuclear weapons. Syria, et cetera, et cetera. North Korea is on this uh, graph, but it has fewer than 30, whereas the United States has close to 6,000. And Russia and the United States are alike in having a third of their arsenals, um, as I think you probably know, on um, steady alert. So there's another important feature of Earth's nuclear architecture, and I'm going to just simplify things and say that no matter what kind of weapon we're talking about, or most weapons that we think of, let's say this pen were um, a knife or a gun. A weapon has two ends. It has the end at which people are injured and it has the end at which it's fired. And nuclear weapons are extraordinary and astonishingly obscene at both ends. They're certainly horrifying at the injuring end um, we know that the scale of injury they can bring about is, is truly ghastly. For example, the most recent work on nuclear winter shows that if not 1% of the arsenal we were looking at a minute ago, but one, no, four one hundredths of 1%, four one hundredths of 1% of that arsenal would lead to 20 million people being dead on the first afternoon and 1 billion people being dead over the next month. Okay, so that's what happens at the injury end. Um, and then at the firing end, there's a, a feature that is equally astonishing, which is that those weapons, whether it's one or 5,000, are launched by a single person, the President of the United States, in the case of the United States, and either between one and about five persons in each of the other countries. So a total of perhaps 20 people on earth have the power to unleash that weaponry and, um, and 
bring about unthinkable damage um, and uh, perhaps even destroy the planet uh, as a whole. I stress the two ends of the weapon because when we speak about weapons of mass destruction, we of course register the fact of the incredible scale uh, and speed of the injury to Earth's inhabitants, not just human, but plants and animals. But the other end of the, of the uh, weapon, the injuring end is equally anomalous and you know, morally equally disgraceful. Um, and there's, a, there's another uh, reason why I want to stress this, and that is, and by the way, the, the, this anomaly at the firing end is not registered by words we have like mass dis weapons of mass destruction and so forth. That only tells us about the scale of the injury. But there's a second reason why I emphasize this, and that's because the harm that's being done at the injur injuring end is something that is addressed by and can be remedied by international law. Whereas the harm that's done at the firing end, the fact that you only have, you have one person who can unleash this, it happens to be President Trump right now, but there were earlier presidents um, who have considered using it and there will be later presidents unless we abolish these things. Um, that side of the weapon is addressed by national law. Um, and we know all the time that, uh, that there was the possibility of nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis. But as I show in Thermonuclear Monarchy, um, there were two times when Eisenhower considered uh, using nuclear weapons, 1954 Taiwan Straits Crisis, and again 1959 Berlin. Um, we know that JFK, according to, um, in, in, according to Robert McNamara, three times came within all-out nuclear war. Uh, we know that Lyndon Johnson says that he considered using a nuclear weapon uh, to prevent China from getting a nuclear weapon. Uh, Nixon has said that he four times considered dropping a weapon. But we as citizens don't hear, we, we heard about the Cuban case. That's the only case where we knew about it while it was happening. Um, and the, this remedy that, by our own national laws, by our own constitution, is as crucial a tool to be using as is the um, presence of international tools. International tools have an overt ethical content. They sound and are moral. They talk about how you, you, it's illegal to carry out disproportionate suffering. It's illegal to commit genocide. It's illegal to have a weapon that doesn't recognize the boundary between uh, participants in a war and neutral countries. And it's illegal to destroy the ozone layer. It's illegal uh, to do many other things. The content is overtly ethical. Constitutional law, in contrast, sounds less exciting, one might say. It sounds less ethical because it's phrased as a procedural step. And yet, what I'm trying, gonna try and say tonight is that this set of procedural steps is, again, full of gravely important ethical content, if we could just open our eyes and understand it. And we need to bring both international law through something like the uh, international a treaty that's now being ratified by other countries and national law to bear on these things, um, these weapons, and um, eliminate them altogether. So I'm going to be focusing on the problem of the, the small number of actors who are able to initiate nuclear war and essentially what the Constitution says, if I could just summarize it in a single sentence, is it says you're not allowed to begin to injure a foreign population until and uh, unless you have persuaded a huge portion of your country that that other country deserves to be injured. Now, 
if you persuade them to go to war against a country, it's possible you'll be making a mistake, but at least you'll have had to make an argument. You don't just carry out the action of destroying this other population and expect your population to turn on the television and learn about it uh, on the nightly news. There, the population has to be consulted. And that um, requirement is carried in two constitutional provisions, uh, two breaks on going to war, both of which have been trashed during the nuclear age. And the reason they've been trashed is because they're utterly incompatible with atomic weapons. So either you can have atomic weapons or you can have a constitution that you're following, you've got to choose. And we chose to have nuclear weapons and to just trash the constitutional provisions. And therefore, the constitutional provisions don't seem very interesting because that's what things look like when you put them in the trash. However, if you brought them back and we have the power to bring them back, you would make these things disappear. And I think that's one key difference between national law and international law. International law has more overt ethical content and it has the uh, backing of many people throughout the world. National law has the advantage that we have, can have more traction on it. Whereas with international law, we can say, you've got to do this. You've got to get rid of these things because international law says so. And our executive government can say exactly what they said when the um, International uh, Nuclear Ban Treaty started being passed. It's like, we're not even paying attention to it. They can't say that about constitutional law. To say, you can't do this because the constitution says you can't. Um, if that has people who will stand behind it, put their hand to it, put their heart to it, um, the, the, I think the, the government has to follow. So it is um, a place where there's more traction. Now the two breaks I was starting to say are first of all, the requirement for a congressional declaration of war. And we've not had a congressional declaration of war since the invention of nuclear weapons because we didn't have one in Korea, we didn't have one in Vietnam. Um, we had, we've invaded lots of other countries, Panama, Haiti, never had one. Former Yugoslavia, no declaration of war. Um, we had an approximation of one, a conditional one in the first Gulf War, but that is never seen as a legitimate declaration um, of war prior in the, in the period before atomic weapons. Um, the second break, is even harder uh, for us today to understand, be again, because it's been trashed and maligned and misunderstood, and that's the Second Amendment, um, which is the uh, distribution to the entire population of authority over whether or not we go to war. That's what the, the uh, Second Amendment originally was. It said, essentially it said this, it, let me say, it, put it this way. Essentially, it's saying that distribution is prior to the question of how much injuring power you have. Maybe you're going to have zero. Maybe you're going to have a huge amount. But however much you have, you're going to divide it equally across the whole citizenry. Now, at the beginning of the Constitution, that whole citizenry was just men. Um, and great care was taken that it should be men of all ages, men of all geographies throughout the United States, men of all wealth levels. That was argued over and over again. But eventually over time, it came to um, include uh, non-white men and then eventually even women uh, through both the, um, the amends with 15th and 19th um, amendments. So, I'll go into each of these briefly, and I go into it much more in the book, and um, you have available the little summary version of my book, but it's also the case that the large book that provides all the evidence for this, which is very expensive, it's $35, but on Amazon there are many books in almost new condition that only cost five or six dollars um, that you can get right on the Amazon site by clicking the thing that says used, used um, books. At any rate, in the section on uh, the Congressional Declaration of War, I contrast the very high level of deliberation that existed when we used to have a Congressional Declaration of War, 
with the nearly absent level of deliberation that we have in uh, when presidents think about whether they're going to use a nuclear weapon. And the congressional cases, I use the five cases where we actually had a congressional declaration of war, and that's the 18, War of 1812, the 1846 uh, Mexican-American War, the 1898 Spanish-American War, and World War I and World War II. And for the example of how presidents deliberate, um, I use the uh, Eisenhower's contemplation of dropping an atom bomb in the Taiwan Straits crisis in 54, and again in Berlin in um, 1959. And there's an array of um, features that distinguish these uh, two ways of deliberation. In the case of Congress, the deliberation is open to the whole public. They're often allowed in during into the chambers during the deliberation. Of course, now it would be on television. Earlier, it would be on radio. In cases where it was a closed session, immediately upon war being declared, the whole transcript was printed and distributed to people in the United States. In contrast, in the case of presidential contemplation of atomic weapon, we don't learn about it until 30 years after the president contemplated using it. And, and by the way, contemplate, I don't just mean that a stray idea went through a president's head. For example, Nixon sent 18 B-52s loaded with nuclear weapons um, over the, the Arctic Circle near Russia at one point. This is, you know, playing with fire would be putting it mildly. Um, but we don't hear about it until many years later, and then it seems safe because we see that it didn't happen. Uh, so we don't need to worry. A second feature is that in the case of Congress, there's a, a very um, explicit set of sentences that everybody in the room understands is what they are debating. Um, be it enacted by, sen by the Senate and House hereby assembled that we hereby declare war. That's the set of sentence. They may argue about this for two days as in one of the deliberations, or it may go on for, um, for, for more than that, or and, and it could be a shorter time. But what, however messy the debate is, they understand that what they're debating is whether to say yes or no about going to war. Whereas in the presidential deliberations about whether to use the atomic weapon, there's no clear statement. Um, and in the case of the congressional uh, deliberation, there's a conspicuously staged vote. Everyone's going to have to come to the microphone and say yes or no. That will be on the record forever, as Jeanette Rankin, the only person who voted no in World War II, it's on, it's on the record forever. There's no vote in the case required in the case of um, presidential uh, deliberation. And um, in the case of Congress, the participants are equal Whereas in the case of, of the presidential table, they're not equal. And that hierarchical nature has many good uses, but one of them isn't deciding whether you're gonna kill millions of people in another country. There you want participants to feel their equality because nobody feels inhibited by the fact that they hold an argument or opinion different than their colleague holds. In fact, they might even want to outshine their colleague, you know, and that is not a negative thing because that provides a kind of motive for trying to think of counter arguments, like let's weigh this, let's test this. And indeed, in the earlier congressional declarations of war, um, they have high levels of deliberation. In the, uh, in the presidential deliberation, there's no such thing, there's no dissent, there's no contestation, there's no testing. Now, some have listened to the Kennedy tapes, you know that Kennedy himself would sometimes introduce counter arguments. You know, well, wait a minute, we have weapons in Turkey. Isn't that just like Russia having them in, uh, in Cuba? But the point is that it's discretionary. If the president wants to introduce that, he can, but there's no built-in structural requirement. And in the Eisenhower papers, let me give you an example of the closest thing there was to dissent in the Taiwan Straits. 
Secretary of the Treasury Humphrey says at a certain point, I just, I, I just want to know how are we going to explain to the American people why islands with names they don't even know, like Quamoy and Matsu, were so important that we dropped an atomic bomb. Eisenhower immediately scolds him. A mere look at the maps on the wall will convince you of the strategic importance of these islands. End of dissent. End of dissent. Uh, you know, Senator Humphrey, like a well-trained member of the presidential team, doesn't say anything more, nor does, any, nor does anyone else um, express that uh, dissent. And in fact, Humphrey is just repeating something that Eisenhower himself had said several months earlier. Um, and, uh, and, and Eisenhower appears not to remember that even he had said something like that. Now, in 1959, in, in 54, Eisenhower believed that if he dropped the atomic weapon, he would be impeached. But he said that he was willing to be impeached um, if, if it was necessary. By fifth, impeached because he was violating the requirement for a congressional declaration of war. By 59, he has um, decided that if he, just, if he just includes a couple of congressmen in his meeting, maybe that will count as uh, a congressional deliberation. And Senator Fulbright, a name that you know, Senator Fulbright is the one dissenting voice. At a certain point, he says, I just want to understand what we're saying. Are you saying that the GDR might take out the Audubon routes in West Berlin and that we might start to rebuild those roads and that a GDR soldier might fire a rifle and then we would drop an atomic weapon? And Eisenhower says, well, we're not exactly sure of the steps that would lead to our dropping it, but we know that once once the, the um, events are underway, there's not going to be time to stop and uh, you know, go to the UN or anything. So he doesn't say, Senator Fulbright, have you lost your mind? Of course we would not retaliate for rifle fire with an atomic bomb. He says, we're not exactly sure of the steps that would lead to it. Um, and that lack of dissent is one of the most important features. Now, the, the right to bear arms is so, um, you know, misconstrued and misdescribed today that I probably need to even begin to convince you, I'd probably need to take the full hour. But I'll just try and, and summarize quickly um, a couple of features to keep in mind. The Constitution is trying to set up a situation in which there's many intervening layers between the thought that you want to injure a foreign population and the actuality of doing it. It's setting up a lot of gates. And by making the population uh, responsible for the arms, they're essentially, the population is essentially ratifying it if the Congress declares war. Do soldiers dissent? Yes, they do. And it's terrible that, um, that our population today has lost sight of this. We all know that in Vietnam, many people dissented um, and, and, uh, and left the, the front. For example, in 1971 alone, 33,000 uh, soldiers deserted. Um, but that's true in every war. For example, we know that the Civil War, the North eventually won, because 250,000 soldiers on the southern side deserted uh, towards the, in the last year of the war. Um, and again, in uh, the end of World War I, the, um, at a certain point, Winston Churchill writes to Lloyd George and says, I wanted to take the soldiers into Russia to stand with the whites against the reds, but I couldn't. The soldiers wouldn't let me. And there were soldier strikes all over England and some in Canada and in India as well. We don't hear about this, but uh, soldiers, what I'm trying to say is when soldiers fight, they allow the war to happen. If they refuse to fight, the war can't happen. That's why 
Military leaders, like Napoleon said, morale factors are to physical factors by a ratio of four to one. Uh, Montgomery in World War II said, in war, morale isn't just one factor, it's the only factor, keeping the consent of the soldiers high. In uh, 1989, uh, the East German army, which had been the strongest of the Eastern Bloc armies, in six months went from 180,000 to 90,000 by desertion. In Romania, soldiers brought down the Ceausescu regime. In Lithuania, um, 2,000 soldiers who had been ordered to fire on their own people not only refused to do that, but went into parliament and signed their names as saying they wouldn't do it. Um, so we, I could go on and on, but it is not the case that soldiers don't dissent. They don't always dissent, that's why we have wars, but the war can't be fought unless they, um, they consent. And I, I won't go through all these because time is short, but I'll just go to number four and say that this is a principle that's been supported by militarists and pacifists alike. It's of course been supported by militarists like Mirabeau in the French Revolution said, you can't have an unequal distribution of arms where the wealthy people have it and the rest of the people don't have arms. Um, but that principle has also been said by pacifists like Gandhi said, of all the evil deeds committed by England against India, the worst is the disarming of our people. Give us back our arms, and then we'll tell you whether we're going to use them or not. And of course, though he had been in the military as a young man, his argument would be that you shouldn't use arms, you should find other ways of um, arguing. But you don't, you can't even make that argument. If you're not needed for the military, um, then whether you don't like it or don't like it is uh, of no interest to um, the, the people who are conducting the war. And my last point under the right to bear arms is just that civil stature in the United States has been premised on military responsibility. The 15th Amendment um, extending the right to vote to African Americans was argued on the basis that 180,000 blacks had fought in the Civil War and had to be given voting rights. The 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote was not as strongly linked to military um, responsibility as was true in the 15th Amendment, but many suffrage pageants showed that women could contribute to the defense of the country and could defend themselves, could defend themselves and could defend other people. The 26th Amendment, which lowered the voting age from 21 to 18 after Vietnam, was argued on the basis that the Vietnam generation, both the soldiers who fought in Vietnam and the people on college campuses who protested Vietnam, had earned for themselves and all future generations the right to vote at a younger age. That's, I'm quoting language from the congressional record of that, um, that vote. So either of these constitutional amendments is a great tool and can be brought to bear on dismantling our nuclear arsenal. Both of them are brilliant inventions and the invention of them goes back way earlier than the constitution. I have many later chapters in the full book showing the place of it in, in um, social contract theory of both of these. Both of them are brilliant inventions, but the fact that there are two of them is also crucial because it means there's a double break. And the only other place where we have a double break is in the making of constitutions themselves. What, as I say on the screen there, what differentiates statutory law from constitutional law is that in constitutional law, you have to not only have Congress pass it, but that it then has to go out to the population and be passed by the states. And so some passing thought that you wanna have such and such an amendment doesn't get transferred into being an amendment until it goes through that double gate. So 500 amendments have been proposed in, co in Congress, but we only have 27 or is it 28 now? 20, we have a tiny number because there's an obstructive path. Um, and the Constitution doesn't want to obstruct things like 
going to the library or making love or raising families or uh, going on picnics or, or uh, having a town council, it doesn't want to obstruct any of those. It wants to obstruct one thing, and that's injuring foreign people. Um, and the, uh, I mean, the uh, war making, if it is subject to that, that kind of double break, we know we've had five declared wars, but how many uh, times have that just passed through people's mind and would we have a lot more if they didn't have to be submitted to um, the population? Um, so these are both very great tools and I also think it's important to recognize that there are other nuclear states that have equivalents. French constitution says that parliament is responsible for declaring war. The Indian constitution in article 246 says the same thing. The Russian constitution says that the president cannot alone up to the border, up to his own border, but he can't go over the border unless the, uh, the body that's the equivalent of our Senate declares war. And it also has an article very much like our right to bear arms that says, in the event of war, every Russian citizen uh, bears responsibility for, um, for, for protecting the country. Um, now, I think all of you know that we, right now we have legislation in Congress, both the Markey Lou bill that restricts first use by the president um, unless Congress has authorized explicitly uh, declared war and also authorized the use of a nuclear weapon. We also have the Warren Smith bill that stipulates the, that the country should have a policy of no first use, under, which, it, which today is our policy. We have a first use uh, policy. Um, and the Warren Smith bill, both of these bills address it um, and try to eliminate that. Um, you probably know these figures in the case of the Markey Lou bill. Um, I put down the numbers for Massachusetts where I'm from, but in Maine, only one of Maine's two representatives in the House um, has so far uh, signed on to the Markey Lou bill and neither of Maine senators, as far as I know, has. Um, something like that is true of the Warren Smith bill. It has 51 co-sponsors in the House um, and a, a small number in the Senate, but in terms of Maine, so far only one of Maine's two representatives in the House has co-sponsored it and neither, as far as I know, neither of Maine's uh, senators have yet. So there is an area where um, in my own state, there's a huge amount of work to be done, and in Maine and in many other states, there's um, a lot of work to be done. So that's the physical architecture of our, um, of our nuclear arsenal. And now I'm going to describe the mental architecture that help keeps, helps keep that in place. And I think that there are six reasons why the United States population is not helping to dismantle uh, this at this time. The first is the lack of information, um, makes it very hard for the population to act. The second is that we hear about this false justification of deterrence, that it's, it's there to protect us, whereas most people can see that it's in, hugely endangering us. Um, a third is the belief that what is future is unreal. It hasn't yet happened, so it must be unreal. And this overlooks the fact that if it takes 10,000 steps to launch a nuclear missile, we've already done 9,999. There's only one more step to go, uh, the launch of the weapon. So yeah, it's only future, but there's only one step that's future. The others are present. Then the difficulty of imagining other people's pain, then the population's false belief that once nuclear weapons are made, they can't be unmade. Um, and then the fact that once you throw out these very shining constitutional provisions, they look kind of rumpled and non-interesting. And so we don't care that we're not following our constitution. Now I can go through each of these briefly, but I know that I should stop in about five minutes so we have time for questions. So let me just say a few things about each of them as fast as I can. Um, you may 
have seen this article by the New York Times where they said, why do we have so many weapons? If we decimated seven opponents and the seven opponents that they took were Libya, Syria, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Russia, and China, if we decimated them, and they took that to mean killed one fourth of the population, how many would be left over? And what they found is that almost all the war, warheads would, would remain. These would remain, these would remain, these would remain, these would remain, these would remain. 70% of our arsenal would still remain, even after we had decimated those other populations. And this kind of redundancy is shown in many other ways. For example, in Dick Cheney's um, autobiography, In My Time, he talks about the fact that while he was vice president, he wondered, um, I wonder how many, you know, I I'm sure you know that our weapons all have designated targets. Um, they're not waiting for war to decide who will be targeted. They're already mated to a target. So he wanted to see how many were uh, targeted on Kiev. And he said that nobody had the answer, but when they eventually figured it out, it turns out that dozens of warheads were targeted on that one city. So all this is to say, this is the kind of information the American public, that's kind of withheld from the American public. The second uh, reason is that we believe this false justification that these, the existence of these weapons will deter nuclear war, even though it's a crazy argument. If they deter nuclear war, why don't we give them to everyone uh, so that they can all deter each other? Um, this is a statement made by General Lee Butler, who is a former commander in chief of the US Nuclear Strategic Command. And he says that deterrence is preposterous. It's premised, to, it's premised on unwarranted assumptions, unprovable assertions, and um, endless contradictions. The third reason is the belief that what is future is unreal, and as I've already said, only the last step is future. We've got all the other steps in place. And it's also the case that real forms of securing, defending the country are being ignored. Uh, for example, the report card given by, by the American Association of Engineers a few years ago gave our bridges a C plus, and this is not an impressionistic grade. They went and looked at all, you know, over 600, they found over 600,000 bridges that were, um, that were in dangerous condition um, and talked about how many millions of people cross over those bridges um, every day. A former boxer? Pardon? Um, and then the roads, they gave a D to saying one in every five miles is uh, in need of repair and that this is contributing to road accidents, road, you know, potholes and so forth. Transit system, they gave us a D minus. Um, our levees, they gave us a D. Uh, so the forms of security, things that could really protect our population are being ignored. And a recent example of this, um, just seem to have lost my cursor, but oh, it's the US Postal Service, which as you know, Trump wants to diminish. And the, the US Postal Service is really, in my mind, a kind of civil defense. My male woman knows how many people live in every house. I live in a crowded neighborhood, but she knows every nook and cranny. Um, she knows what number people live at. She knows what people are on disability so that if ever you had to go into houses and find out if people are okay. It, you know, our postal service, our, our postal teams are like the true intelligence service that has uh, a lot of information about the population. And yet, as you know, it's at this moment being, in, it's in danger of being dismantled. The fourth um, thing that prevents people from helping to dismantle the nuclear arsenal is, is the very great difficulty of imagining other people's pain. And um, there are lots of reasons for this. Uh, uh, one that I think is very important is a point made by somebody in the um, School of Public Health at 
Cornell Medical, who said that we're pretty good at narrative compassion, but we're not good at statistical compassion. If you say 44 million people are going to die, people kind of can't take in what that means. Whereas if you say uh, John so-and-so is going to die, people can get it, but they can't get it when it's large numbers. But there's also other reasons. A recent article in Atlantic reports that power literally causes brain damage by diminishing people's mirror neurons in their brains. The mirror neurons are what helps us understand a, another person's situation and to get out of our own brain and think about another person's um, brain. So our very powerful country um, has lost, I think, its ability to think symmetrically. Um, I think a very important fact is we don't look at the injuries that happen in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One of my colleagues, Joseph Gerson, and I, um, two years ago, held a month-long uh, session at one of our public libraries on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And it was, all, it was great. We're very grateful to the library. We had lots of good talks and so forth. But the first night, we put up a, a photo display when we came in the next morning, any pictures of the injuries had been taken down. In Japan, small school children go into the museums. This is the Nagasaki Museum. And they look, they face up to what nuclear weapons do. They look at really terrifying things of what it does to the human face, um, if people are even lucky enough to survive. But you may know that when the 50th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki came around, the Smithsonian was supposed to have a big exhibition, but it was so controversial that they had to cancel it. And the only thing they exhibited was the Enola Gay, uh, the airplane that dropped the bomb, rather than the reality of what happened to people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Another reason is the false belief that many people have that once a nuclear weapon is made, you can't unmake it, which is crazy. It's a crazy idea. Um, here's a study that was done by John Ainsley in England that shows the timetable for dismantling the UK's nuclear weapons. And they have many fewer than we do. They just have, um, I think, four Trident submarines, uh, and they don't have air-delivered or um, ground ICBMs. How, uh, so you, it would take longer for the United States, and yet it's a finite amount of time. It takes only hours to dismantle the nuclear triggers. Um, and then it takes uh, you know, days to do other parts of the dismantling. But the whole thing in the UK could be done in between two and four years. Um, another sign that we can dismantle them is shown by the whole global south, which is blanketed with nuclear weapons free zones. Um, if they can do it, we should be able to do it. In fact, the nuclear architecture is a north-south architecture. All the nuclear weapon states are northern. All the nuclear weapons free zones are southern hemispheres. And this is part of the racism of our nuclear architecture. And then finally is the circularity of uh, why we can't bring our constitution to bear. As I said a few moments ago, if you've let these constitutional provisions lie on the ground as though they were uninteresting and could easily just be violated, then they don't even seem like the, you know, brilliant inventions that they are. And uh, people don't realize that they not only have a tool that could be used to abolish these things, they've actually got it right there in their desk drawer or their pocket, wherever it is that they keep their copy of the U.S. Constitution. So, this is just uh, an image from Hobbes's social contract. He said that the biggest, um, the biggest problem that could ever happen to a country is the massacre of the citizenry. And he said, if that happens, it can't happen in any place where there's a government. It can't happen where there's oligarchy, aristocracy, a a monarchy, democracy. It can only happen where there's anarchy. Um, and it's, of course, our, our nuclear architecture arranges for the massacre of the citizenry. Um, I am thermonuclear monarchy 
with a quotation from Locke where he talks about the fact that the tyrant, the bloodthirsty tyrant Caligula um, wished that the whole, all the people had but a single neck so he could dispatch them in a single blow. And that has been literalized in the nuclear arsenal where one man can literally take all of human beings and, and again, animals and plants. We all have one neck and we can all be dispatched in a single blow. So just in conclusion, I think that if we can dismantle it, we'll obviously have done a great deal for our Earth. And I think we'll even have done something for the universe by possibly being the first planet that has ever made it through this extremely difficult moment where our own super intelligence has let us make something that also um, lets us blow ourselves up. And I'll stop screen sharing now so we can see one another more easily. And uh, we we'll welcome questions. Thank you so much, Professor Scary. Um, uh, we have had one question in the chat so far, but um, if anyone thinks of a question, you can get to the chat box um, from the toolbar at the bottom of the screen if you begin to hover over it and you can type your question into the chat box or you can raise your hand and ask to be unmuted to ask a question aloud. So I'll start with our first question that we've got in the chat. So I have to scroll back up to it. Um, okay, um, so our first question from the audience is, uh, which is actually from Martha, thank you for submitting this, Martha, is Professor Scary, do you have any comments about President Trump's recent reference to a new weapons system that it might be uh, available soon and which has been implied to be nuclear? I don't, but maybe one of you has information. I mean, I know that he has backed the idea of lower yield nuclear weapons, which are being opposed by um, you and, and me because it's understood that they let the threshold be crossed more easily. Um, and there's also a lot of talk in, um, I, for example, subscribe to the Proceedings of the Naval Academy, which is a, a, a journal that often has many interesting art and thoughtful articles in it, but it also reports on uh, new weapons. And there is a lot of talk about um, Russia getting these, you know, I can't remember the term, it's more than supersonic, you know, the, the amount of deliv the delivery time would be tiny and of our now needing to get those. So it may be something like that that he's thinking of as well. But does anybody it's have- hypersonic. Mm. Hypersonic missiles. Mm. Hypersonic, thank you. Yeah. Um, and of course, all our weapons are being upgraded with the trillion dollar um, renewal. And there's, I looked online, you, you can find online various ways of understanding these different money amounts. And I think that um, the, what I read is that a million dollars is a stack of hundred dollar bills, you know, some 10 feet high or something. A million dollars is, uh, might, you know, is, is huge. I can't remember what it is. But a trillion dollars is a third of the way to the moon. Uh, if you take these thin sheep of hundred dollar bills, it's a third of the way to the moon. Um, and uh, I think right now it's at 1.7 trillion is being spent on, on uh, these renewal of nuclear weapons. So for example, we right now have 12 Ohio class submarines, each carries the equivalent of 4,000 Hiroshima blasts. That means each of them can destroy a continent single-handedly without any other submarine. Um, the Earth has seven continents. We have 12 Ohio class submarines. And now we're getting um, 
12 new ones. Um, we're getting 12 new uh, Columbia, I think it's called, class submarines that are an upgrade of these. And uh, likewise with our bombers and our ground-based missiles. Thank you, Professor. Uh, does anyone have an additional comment on the President's recent implications about a new, potentially nuclear weapon system? You can physically raise your hand and I can unmute you. Stephen does. And I think you can unmute yourself, actually, Stephen. I can, actually. Um, yes, I heard that um, reported, um, as a matter of fact, it was this week. I listened to it this morning on the Rachel Maddow show. Um, it was something which was, I guess, corroborated uh, that there was some additional, some kind of weapon, but then, of course, no one should have really been technically talking about that in the open public. So uh, it essentially escalates uh, the arms race, this kind of discussion. If you're another country, you're going to have to take that uh, statement um, kind of, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a potential fact, you know, uh, because it's all about um, potentiality. Um, um, seems like it's just another excuse for the, you know, the for this stuff to get out of control. Uh, some of these figures are really like like making me real here. Um, but on, on the other side of it, as we were polling earlier, I think on the costs of war and climate, it's just like each one of those decisions, each one of those submarines. I mean, you know, the money represents like how much suffering before we even launch any, you know, hopefully not launch any kind of a missile. And I have something in the chat there I sent. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, I can read Stephen's uh, comment from the chat, which is, oh wait, I just lost it. Um, and we do have a question also from Chris. Uh, you want me to read it, uh, Devin? Yeah, if you have it up, I had it. In, oh, I found it. So okay. doc, Dr. Scary, thank you, Stephen. Dr. Scary mentioned that a small percentage of deployment of weapons is necessary to create a nuclear winter. This seems to make the abstraction of or misunderstanding of their power and use much more dangerous. It's could you just read it one more time? Yeah, sorry, I read it quickly. Um, Dr. Scary mentioned that a small percentage of deployment of weapons is necessary to create a nuclear winter. This seems to make the abstraction of our, excuse me, or misunderstanding of their power and use much more dangerous. So Christopher, do you mean that, uh, that I Sorry, could that elaborate was a little a bit. Comment from Stephen. And yeah. In Steven. other words, it's like um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that um, you know, uh, for example, there's members of Congress didn't know we were involved, and I think it was Mali or wherever where this whole you know these soldiers got killed. They didn't even know they were deployed there. So there's just lack of understanding of like what we have. We have so much lack mm -hmm. of understanding of like like what it really means. The actual power. And so it's easy to minimize, it seems. You know, we have a president talking about these incredible weapons, but like the ones we have are like beyond, I mean, it just seems what, when you mentioned that, it really threw me back. That, 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 in other words, it could minimize the idea of him making a mistake and not even know the mistake is inordinate. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, what, he, what, what uh, Alan Roebuck and his team of researchers meant was, uh, four one hundredths of one percent of the total blast power. So it it isn't uh, it, it. They were imagining an exchange of fifty uh, relatively modest sized nuclear weapons, and they took the example of India versus Pakistan, um, and what would result from that. Um, but yeah, if we, I mean, imagine if. We had um, a president or a Congress or anyone who had a weekly 
radio show explaining to people, now I'm gonna tell you about this part of the arsenal um, what, and what it does. I'm gonna tell you what actually happens on an Ohio class submarine where they practice 24 hours a day, day in and day out, you know, other than when they're sleeping. There's only one day in the whole, um, you know, three months, they go in three month cycles. They come back in after three months and change to another team. They have one day when they're not practicing for destroying some other country. And, you know, how can, how can, I mean, things that are practiced over and over again are things that eventually get done. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it, it's, it's only because people don't know how lethal these, a small number of these things are, can there be any reason to think they, that we should sign on to getting yet more um, of them, for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so, Nancy, but, yeah. Um, Oh, is Nancy? Oh, Nancy, you can unmute yourself. And then we do have a question from Chris and one from Stan that I was hoping to. Are you unmuted now? Yes, great. Thank you, Nancy. I don't think I'm next up, but I was just going to say, what can we do? I mean, I'm asking the question that's in all of our minds. Um, you, Elaine, just asked the question, if people knew some of these numbers, knew some of these percentages, it would be a small step toward changing people's minds or making them aware of the need to do something or start doing things right now. But how do we get that kind of word out? It's a good question. I mean, I ask myself every day. I feel as though I'm speaking on a frequency and, uh, and there's no reception for that frequency. So I change the frequency, but there's no reception for that frequency. It's a good you know, metaphor. Yeah, and we have to find the frequency that, that makes it audible. I do think that um, I do think that that I'm beginning to think that the racism that's involved in the nuclear architecture is one that people might be able to hear. Um, you know. It, when you talk about the racism, people get very upset. If you say these weapons are genocidal, they just kind of like shrug, like, yeah, genocide, so what? When you say they're genocidal and they're racist, people feel ashamed, you know? And we should feel ashamed. I mean, Bruce Blair told me that, um, that General Lee Butler has written somewhere that if the population does not find a way of expressing the, um, the fact that it doesn't want first use to be our policy. That is, if it doesn't find a way of getting these Marky Lou and Warren Smith bills through, then if the United States does launch a first use weapon, we are, our population is then a legitimate um, site for reta a retaliatory strike because we have, we have not, opposed it, we have accepted it. And that puts us, you know, in the position of having, you know, com have, of having complicity in this, in this act. Thank you. Um, I Thank think you. Oh, go ahead, Andrea. sorry. I just wanna make sure to ask Chris's question because yes. he yes. Uh, asked it in the chat as we requested. And so he asks, uh, and thank you all for your patience this evening. I know we're running over uh, our regularly scheduled programming. Um, but Christopher asked one question I have, having admiration for the study of Shakespeare's sonnets, Elaine has written, how intertwined was the writing and research process given tonight's focus? Well, I just lost the last sentence. How intertwined? Apologies. Um, how intertwined was the writing slash research process given tonight's focus? Um, you mean, in, how do those two subjects go together? Who, whose question is it? This is Chris's question, yeah. You know, to me, the, uh, 
first of all, those are both books that I worked on for many years. I started, uh, as, as Devin said, I started working on thermonuclear monarchy literally in 1987 um, and, and published parts of it uh, in the 90s in law review journals and so forth, and then put the whole thing together in 2014. But the Shakespeare book, which is a very different subject, um, it's about Shakespeare's beloved young man. And um, I'm pretty sure that, um, that almost by accident, I, I came upon who that's likely to be, this other poet. And when you put the two together, you can hear that Shakespeare's sonnet goes with this man's sonnet here. And then, uh, you know, Shakespeare will talk about such and such. And this other person, Henry Constable, in his poem will talk about it. And they're just like, literally scores and scores of overlaps between their sonnets. And that was something that I first started working on in 1995 and then just published a couple of years ago. And on the face of it, they don't seem to go together. However, there's, um, there's something that I, uh, I think is, is true in, in a Brecht play, in, in Bertolt Brecht's Caucasian Chalk Circle. He says that if you can't hear, um, if you can't hear the cry of a child, you also can't, um, you also can't fall in love or have a lover. Um, and it's 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 a beautiful, a beautiful working out of that in Caucasian Chuck Circle. But I do feel as though caring is all of you do about these people who stand to be harmed by our nuclear weapons makes me also able to hear the voice of, of uh, lovers, in the case of Shakespeare and this other poet, um, in a way that uh, is, it just, it just seems so immediately apparent to me. Um, so I don't know, does that answer the question? Yes, that does. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that you dovetailed those answers together with Bertolt Brecht's Caucasian Chuck Circle. Um, can I follow up um, with something that you, you shared surprisingly in um, terms of how you brought it into contract theory? I, in your presentation, you spoke about the right to bear arms and you supported it surprisingly by quoting Gandhi, when mm -hmm. he says, first give them, give us them back, and then we'll let you know what we decide. Um, so I'm digesting that in terms of what you said with contract theory of consent and um, in, in, in terms of um, the F-35, for example, as a project that's disseminated in the small sub, 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 sub contracting when there'll be these tiny pieces that'll be made. Mm. Is that how <clears throat> in some way our, our consent gets manipulated? Um, first, give us these contracts, and then you've bought out our our consent, or you've silenced us. Or anyway, I won't pass back to you that quote from Gandhi and ask you. I mean, again, I found it really helpful. You you kind of helped bring me. I, I found it uh, an interesting rhetorical move. Yeah, I think that. I mean, I think that's right. That uh, that people by, uh, by helping to make these weapons, they are uh, building their consent into it. And, and yet, I, you know, I think that, that there's so much that intrigues them about solving this physical problem of how do you get, uh, how, do you, how do you solve this physics problem of getting this targeted from, uh, several hundred feet under the ocean and so forth, that it makes the whole moral question disappear. It, it, isn't, it isn't like people are debating, now tell me again what the people in North Korea did, those people that we dumped all this napalm on in the mm -hmm. Korean War, um, what, what is it that they, they've done that we're gonna now uh, drop an atom bomb on them? Um, those aren't the kind of questions that are happening at Raytheon um, or at Northrop Grumman. In, these, in this magazine that I subscribe to, 
there are often these advertisements for these products made by Boeing and Northrop Grumman and Raytheon and so forth. And they often make the, the specific kind of airplane look, uh, you know, look you know, beautifully designed. Um, there's one advertisement for, for radar where it just shows a light bulb and then the little filaments in the light bulb trace out the shape of a ship. And it's like a kind of, a kind of celebration of the ingenuity that's required to solve the specific radar problem that they're talking about, you know? And, and yet it's, it's so divorced from, um, from the actuality of the harm. You may know a book that was done um, back, I think, in the 80s called uh, At Home with the Bomb in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, it, was, it was called uh, Graceful Assurance, something like that. Um, and the, the, the author wanted to know how people live with the final assembly plant um, and found that, that they live with it by believing that uh, the nuclear holocaust will be the vehicle for the rapture and that um, it will bring about the second coming of, of Christ and uh and they'll all they'll all be saved i think that some of you have probably read the left behind series of books which have i think they've been read by 60 million people which have that same thesis um that that nuclear weapons are the vehicle of the rapture in fact in one of them that i read um the way you recognize the antichrist is that the Antichrist is going around arguing that nuclear weapons should be abolished. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, and, and this gets translated because I don't know if you saw it, but a number of years ago, uh, Truth Out exposed the fact that at the, at, at the Air Force, they were training missile silo uh, launch officers in an ethics course where they had one session that the, the students called Jesus Loves Nukes, where they were being taught that, uh, that this was completely compatible with what Jesus wanted. And you know, maybe there are other religions that are also being enlisted into this. So yeah, I, I, they're, they're, you know, on the one hand, I want to say there's no consent. The population has been read out. The whole architecture is there. It's ready to go. 2,000 are on alert. All it takes is that phone call. Um, and on the other hand, it's not entirely true to say there's no consent because we've got a silent population and we've got people working at these various companies making these weapons. You know, Gandhi also said, you can wake a man who's asleep, but you can't wake a man who's pretending to be asleep. And the question is, is the population asleep or is it just pretending to be asleep? Because if it wakes up, it's got to do something, you know, and, uh, and it's hard enough to get on with our daily lives without trying to, you know, dismantle a nuclear missile. But um, I think, Chris, you, you, did you work with Sister Megan Rice? So you've, you've worked on trying to dismantle um, weapons. It's, it's always a question for all of us, you know, what is the best, what are the ways uh, what are the best ways of dismantling these? You know, I think that other countries, you know, we witnessed what um, our own country did or our own country in combination, um, apparently with Israel intelligence in um, the Staltnik's virus. Are, are, are you all aware of that virus? 
this tremendous documentary on it, and I'm forgetting its name at this moment, um, but it's something everybody should see, uh, where we unleashed a, a virus that, that uh, dismantled their, actually, I think peaceful uranium, you know, heavy water uh, facilities. And uh, that's not something that can only be done by the United States. There are people capable of hacking in every country. And uh, it may be that, uh, that that will be the way in which these things are unmade eventually. Thank you so much, Elaine, and thank you for that question, Chris. That was a very uh, dynamic back and forth. Um, and with that, we are approaching 8.30, and so I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, but before we let everyone go, I wonder if people who are on video would be willing to have a, uh, a quick group photo. And so if you agree, uh, stay present, and if you don't agree, you can turn your video off. Um, at the bottom, you can click stop video. Um, but so Brenton is going to take a screenshot for us and we just want to commemorate this moment and everyone's participation in this very novel uh, annual meeting that is so different from our previous ones. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Professor Scary, and thank you everyone else for your participation. Okay. Done. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brenton. Thank you. Um, and so, thank you so much. And uh, there will be a recording posted to our website at some point uh, for anyone who would like to return. And for anyone who did not get to ask their question, um, we do hope to have Professor Scary back, uh, hopefully sooner than later. And so there shall be future opportunities to communicate. Um, and you can always submit a question to us at the Peace Action email address. Thank you everyone for your patience tonight and for bearing with us. And I hope everyone has a lovely evening. And again, thank you so much, Professor, for being with us. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. See you again soon, I hope. Stay well. Yes. Be well. Bye.